So tonight I'm pleased to welcome Kathyun uh, Khalil, who will be discussing the importance of employing social sciences to understand the full complexity of wildlife issues. Um, right now, Kathyun just recently has a position at the Oregon Zoo where she is the uh, director or the conservation impact director. Um, it's a brand new position. She's uh, getting to design what it may be in the future. Um, it's an awesome title. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was the principal evaluator at the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, but she started her career actually at the Oregon Zoo. Um, after that, she's gone on to receive a PhD in learning sciences and technology and design from uh, Stanford University, her master's in environmental science from Yale, um, the School of Forestry, and her bachelor's degree is in organismal biology from Claremont McKenna College. Her previous positions include the director of evaluation at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Khalil is a alumna of the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leaders Program and an instructor for Project Dragonfly at Miami University of Ohio. Just real quick, how many of you guys have participated in that program as well that are in the audience? So several of you guys out there. Um, Khalil has uh, consulted on education and evaluation for zoos and aquariums across the country. She serves uh, as the champion of the Associated... Association of Zoos and Aquariums Education Research and Evaluation Initiative, uh, and she's an editor, uh, editorial board member for the journal Zoo Biology. It's my pleasure to welcome Kathy Yoon Khalil. All right, they said this would turn on as soon as I start. There it is. Excellent. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I am very excited to be here today talking about. A subject that I think is critically important and probably not discussed enough in wildlife conservation. So as Dave said, um, I have a bunch of degrees and work in a bunch of places. But really, what I'm here to talk to you today is about something that I came through through a pretty organic journey. Um, when I started out in zoos and aquariums, I thought I had to be a biologist. I thought to work in a zoo and aquarium, you got to put your boots on the ground and work with animals. You scoop your poop, and that's how you get where you need to be. But I wasn't very good at that, right? I'm good at talking to people. I'm good at making friends. I'm good at building relationships. So I started to wonder if there was a career there, if there was something in wildlife conservation that had to do with the people side of things and the animal side of things. And that got me through those degrees and those positions to the place where I am now, where I think about and work on conservation psychology. So what conservation psychology means is it's all the emotions and the um, values and the identity pieces that go into the environmental decisions, the behaviors that we make on a daily basis. Trying to understand those and all their complexities and apply those to creating a more sustainable world for everybody. So to frame this talk, let's talk a little bit about where we are right now in the world. It's a very interesting time to be alive. There's a lot going on. We have... <laughs> We have a mass extinction happening, the sixth major mass extinction in the history of the world. Um, but mo what makes this mass extinction more interesting is that it is primarily caused by anthropogenic factors. It's also occurring at a faster rate than any other extinction spasm that we've encountered in the history of the world. And there are more species in danger. So that alone is pretty scary that we're going through this spasm in time. But to add on top of that, we live in a time where we have to pledge and march on behalf of the sciences. And our field, this is my own zoo, our field is undergoing a crisis of conscience. Who are we? How do we stay relevant? Who are these people who are so against us and what do they have to say? And how can we take all of that and keep on doing what we're trying to do on a daily basis? So if you wrap all of that together, it seems it's pretty, it's pretty overwhelming. It can be a pretty challenging time to be a wildlife conservationist. But where other people see a lot of problems, I, off, I try, and I hope that you will try with me, to see opportunities. And this is what really drives me in the field of wildlife conservation, in the field of wildlife social sciences, is this opportunity to take these challenging times, all these people problems that are occurring in our world, and turn them into solutions for the problems that we see. So here's a deep, dark truth for you. Conservation is broken. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you that. I'm also sorry to tell you that conservation is broken and it is kind of our fault. A very long time ago, in the 30s, a very smart man said this. 
I'm not going to read it to you because I know you can read, but I've highlighted some big pieces. Aldo Leopold, Sound County Almanac, one of the formative pieces of writing in our field, called this out in the 1930s that the inevitable fusion of two lines of thought, biology and the social sciences, will constitute the outstanding advance of this century. Now, this is both very inspiring and also extremely depressing. So in 1930-something, Aldo Leopold said this, and in almost 2030, 10, you know, 10 years short of that, where are we in pursuit of this fusion? So I offer you that. I will close with one other person's words, but these, these struck me as I was thinking about this lecture. Conservation is largely built on a foundation of norms, as are many other fields, um, norms that we have come to expect and accept over time. Um, these are false. These are, these are some of the basic premises of conservation. First of all, that conservation is an animal problem. Second, si second is that hard sciences are rigorous and soft sciences are not. And third, that conservation prioritizes animals over the lives of humans and their livelihoods. So we're going to dismantle each of these norms together now um, so you can see not only why they're wrong, but why they're increasingly problematic and how the social sciences can help us to understand that. So first of all, conservation is not an animal problem. Conservation is a people problem. Let that sink in again. Conservation at its root, we think, when you think of the word conservation, you think of animals. But conservation is a people problem. We have created the problems that we are now trying to undo and trying to solve. Animals do go extinct. That is a fact of the universe. We are OK with some animals going extinct. But we cannot be OK with the rate at which animals are going extinct now. We can see this in a lot of, we can see, if we try to deconstruct this, we see a lot of factors. What, what is behind this norm is this idea of rejection of responsibility and othering. If it's about the animals, then we don't have to take ownership for the problems that we've created. We don't have to question things like our own affluence, our own consumption behaviors, because it is not really us that's driving the extinction. This is all something natural that would happen anyway. And that leads to dismissal. Examples of this, at my own zoo, we work on condor conservation. Condor conservation is entirely a people problem. Condors eat carrion. Carrions have lead. Lead makes condors have lead poisoning. That seems like a pretty simple chain of events. And the solution to that is to give hunters copper bullets instead of lead bullets. OK, seems like a pretty, common, pretty easy solution. But even that in itself creates all sorts of difficulties with people's livelihoods and their hobbies and their values and their identities. So to dismantle that people problem becomes very, very, very challenging. Plastics is another people problem that is very visible. I can show you a few iconic images, and you can get a visceral response from that, and you automatically understand what we have created in the oceans to generate this kind, the enormity and scale of this problem. This is my favorite one. So, <laughs> so I get a lot of flack for this. I'm going to throw my parents under the bus a little bit here. I love them very, very much. But they will often, my dad's a physicist. So talk about a hard science, right? Other sciences have physics envy. I get from them a lot, well, you're in one of the soft sciences. You're not in a hard science like your dad. So hard sciences and soft sciences, those terms actually came about because of the adherence of the subject to the scientific method. How strictly does that field stick to the observation, question, hypothesis, data collection, results, conclusion that we learned in like seventh grade science class? That is what it means to be a hard and soft science. What that has turned into is a way of diminishing the soft sciences as being less than the hard sciences. And I'll talk about, more about that in a second. What I would like to propose instead is that there is no such thing as hard science and soft science. Science is science. Because what we mean when we say soft science is we are feminizing science. The rejection of, the, of soft science is a feminization of the subject and a subsequent dismissal based on that feminization. So if you're willing to follow me there, our rejection of the soft sciences and of social sciences is based in the patriarchy. And it's based in a patriarchal system that diminishes women's work as being women's work, right? As being something that is soft, something that is less than, something that is not as rigorous or as challenging or as rigid as the work of men. We see this also in education, one of the social sciences, and an applied soft science 
that education becomes women's work and therefore less important in our facilities, gets less funding, et cetera. And so when we frame, when we peel back the layers and frame it that way, we can see how damaging that kind of a construct really is or that kind of an assumption. I'm not even going to give you examples of hard science versus soft science because I think you know it in your gut and you've seen it so many places. In my research, I do qualitative research, and my, and my sample sizes are sometimes one. Sometimes they're three. If I'm lucky, they're 40. Right? It doesn't have to be big data to be good science. And I think that is something we're going to have to let go of. That is something we're going to have to respect if we're going to truly be able to integrate social science into wildlife conservation work. The third is very, the third damaging norm is also one that is it's very problematic. So conservation prioritizing animals over human lives and livelihoods. Examples of this, um, well, let's talk about, yeah, OK, examples of this. I didn't even want to put a picture up because it felt weird to put a picture of like displaced people in a slide. But conservation has a history of displacing indigenous people for conservation land holding, right? This has happened. If you Google it, it's unfortunately over and over in Indonesia and in the Congo and in India where conservationists come in and take a piece of land that they want to protect and therefore push out all of the people who live in that land and say, you're not taking care of it well enough. This happened on my own grad school campus. There was a salamander or a newt or something. I wasn't really paying attention. Um, that was living in the lake and the salamander newt amphibian of some sort um, required great lengths to be able to survive in this lake that would get, you know, that would dry up every year, et cetera. And the solution to it was so uh, remarkably ignorant of what people actually wanted from the lake, what people actually wanted to use that space for, that everyone laughed off what could have otherwise been a pretty interesting conservation project that the campus could have gone on board with. But we have created a field in which people look at us and think, you only care about the animals. You don't care about the people at all. And so what I would say instead is that conservation should, maybe it doesn't already, but it should prioritize animals alongside human lives and livelihoods. And very much further, conservation and social justice are inextricably linked. Conservation work is social justice work. And I want you to remember that, because I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. So dismantling that a little bit, what it comes to is a, a bit of oversimplification about the root causes of conservation issues. So when we say that conservation is just about people, or just about animals and not about people, we're ignoring things like colonialism, systemic inequity, other issues that have led to problems that have created systems of affluence, systems of discrimination that also put animals at the bottom of those chains. And so when we think about how to prioritize animals alongside people, we have to pay attention to the fact that nobody's going to care about our conservation work if they feel like they can't feed their families, if they're living in food deserts, if they're unable to pay their rent. And those issues underlie all of the conservation work that we do. And so we have to understand the, the, the inextricable nature of both social justice issues and environmental justice issues as being one and the same. So now that I've burdened you with all of these dark sides of conservation, I want to turn it back to the rosy glasses, and I want to talk about solutions. The first solution, when I was thinking about solutions, I was thinking a lot about zoos and aquariums, because this is the world that I live in, and I also believe a lot in this work. There are a lot of things that we all could be doing with our lives. There are a lot of ways we could make more money, we could live more comfortably. There are also ways in which we can do a lot of social good. But we choose to patronize these institutions. We choose to involve ourselves to volunteer, to work, to pay admission, to come to events like this that support the aquarium. So let's talk about what we can do in our facilities right here. So the first thing I would, I would beseech you to do is to know good science when you see it. When you see conservation work, when you see conservation projects, I want people to ask. I want us to push. Where are people being considered in this project? Is this a project that only looks at counting the number of animals in this small part of some savanna habitat? Or is this a project that has included people who live in the surrounding areas of that savanna habitat to take ownership of their land and figure out how to solve these problems together? Is this helicopter conservation where someone is flying in, dropping a bunch of money and flying out? 
or is this something that's more integrated across stakeholders? When we start to ask each other these questions, we start to ask conservation scientists to become accountable to these standards when they're doing conservation work. If we are reading papers and watching TV shows and listening to media that propagates the idea that science is just biology, then that's all science is ever going to be, or conservation science is ever going to be. We need to ask and see good science and recognize it when we see it. And fundamental to all of this is building relationships. So one, maybe one of the reasons that conservation social science has been so challenging is because it's damn hard. It is very, very hard. Because what we want to do is go in and not talk to anybody and spend time with animals and expect to see some sort of result. But good social science requires you to build relationships. And sometimes your research could take 10 years. Sometimes it could take 20 years. Sometimes it can take your whole life to build the relationships that are going to be necessary to get people on board with the kinds of conservation outcomes that we really want to see. And so building those relationships starts with the most fundamental building blocks of any social society is just getting to know people for who they are, building empathy. Empathy is a big passion of mine, something I love talking about. Um, and we talk a lot about empathy for animals, but empathy for animals and empathy for people work through the same neural channels in your brain. And so if we can practice empathy for the animals that live in this aquarium, we should also be trying to practice empathy for the people who live in the systems that are influenced by our conservation decisions around the world. One of my, this one came from talking to one of my friends whose daughter is in that phase of her life where she asks why for everything all the time. And she was like, it's driving me crazy. And when she said that, I was like, oh, that's kind of what I do for a living. Good social science requires us to ask why over and over and over and over again. The, there's a practice called root cause analysis. And root cause analysis asks you to ask why six times to try to get to a root cause of a problem. So for example, like why do I keep sleep? OK, I keep sleeping in. That's a problem. How do I stop sleeping in so much? Well, why do I keep sleeping in? Well, I'm tired when my alarm goes off. Why are you tired when your alarm goes off? Because you watched too many episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Why did you watch too many episodes of Buffy? Because I didn't have anything else to do and I was too tired. So we have to ask ourselves why over and over to get to the cause. The cause may be boredom and sadness over the state of the world or whatever. But if we can apply that same concept to the sciences, we can start to understand some of these root causes. Why are condors going? Why are condors endangered? Why are people choosing to lead, use lead bullets? Why are copper bullets less, um, less, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Desirable. <laughs> Why are copper bullets less desirable than lead bullets? Why, you know, and when we start to break that kind of thing down and act like that three-year-old, um, we can start to see what are we really trying to tackle? What are the human problems that we're really trying to influence here instead of just starting with, well, let's get them all to use copper bullets, easy. And questioning existing norms. You know, these norms, when I was thinking about this, I was starting to get really angry, especially about the hard science, soft science thing. I was starting to get really worked up and really angry. And I thought, yes, hold on to that. Like, keep that drive. Like, keep that motivation to question everything, right? Question how we have been doing conservation, because how we've been doing conservation thus far, by and large, has it worked. So what's the new way that we can do conservation? What are the new models that we can use? And why not give them a try? Because by questioning these norms, we allow space for new ideas and new options to enter into our sphere. And maybe those won't work either, but I think we might as well give them a try. And the last one is telling the right stories. And this loops back to the beginning when we were talking about, um, we were talking about pushing forward the right ideas of science, the right images of science. And I would say that the inclusion, and, and this draws back also to what I was saying about social justice, because the inclusion of social sciences in conservation is not for our benefit, I would say. The inclusion of social sciences in conservation is a social justice issue because those people's voices deserve to be heard. Let's think, I'm going to say that one more time. It is not about the social scientists. That is not the reason why I'm standing here asking you to think about these things. It is about the people whose lives are impacted by the conservation work we're doing. They deserve to be part of these processes. They deserve to be valued and respected as humans. And it is our job as, pur as purveyors of social justice to include them in the conversations that will influence their lives. I'm going to close with this quote. 
So this quote came from a very powerful piece that was written about the vaquita conservation issues. Um, some of you who've read that piece, this was the most common one to pull out and post on Facebook when you retweeted this piece. It's time for us to realize that conservation isn't about biology anymore. If you are standing on the shore of some poor little town, looking out over the water, trying to figure out how to save some inspiring ocean species, just stop and turn around 180 degrees. That's where your work is. Thank you. I was a little shy of 45 minutes. <laughs> but more time for discussion, I hope. Lots of time for discussion. Yeah. So we have Linda is in the back with a microphone. I have a microphone here. And uh, we have time for, for conversation. So please help us out. Well, I want to thank you for your lecture. It was very, very enlightening. Um, when you spoke about the bullets, the copper bullets, mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of looking at them as being toxic, but mm -hmm. can you explain more in detail what problems are occurring as a result of the copper bullets, and what can we as mankind do to help make a difference to turn it around? Yeah. What r road should we travel to just not sit on it and go forward and have something positive result? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite positive conservation stories, the story of the condor. So um, I'll skip the whole part where they were 18. We took them into captivity and you know bred them, and now there's 300. But the copper bullet, lead bullet situation. So lead bullet has lead, um, and it fragments when it enters into carrion. And then hunters forget where they, or they can't find what they shot down, right? So the carrion falls somewhere, and they can't find it, and they move on to something else. And then the condors, because they eat carrion, come down, eat it, get lead poisoning. Copper bullets are actually the solution to that. So copper bullets are, don't have the same poisoning opportunities as lead bullets do, but there are, there's a, if you are a marksman kind of person, there are downsides to copper bullets. Um, some say they're less effective, some say that they don't have the same power to take down the animal, et cetera. So what we've done at the Oregon Zoo that I'm like, this is amazing, we have hired a hunter. Um, he is our, our lead bullet education specialist. Um, he is well respected in the hunting community. And he goes to uh, gun shows. He goes to whatever hunt, hunter gatherings. Uh. Uh. <laughs> and he talks to them. He is part of their community. He is a person that they respect. He is a person that they trust. And he says, listen, I get it. I, am par I know what you feel because I was skeptical too. Here's how I can show you that they are effective, they are, you know. And he, we just got an amazing report that he'll go out and do these marksman demonstrations that no one else would attempt to do, let alone with copper bullets. And he'll knock it out of the park every time. And that just does more to get respect and get um, understanding for his point of view. And so that is a perfect example of how we can leverage our own, we're all part of groups, right? We all are part of many different groups. We all hold many different identities. Maybe you're a golfer. Maybe you're a rower. Maybe you're an artist. What are the communities in which we already have entree that we can go in and say, I get it. I'm with you. I live, this, I live the life like you lead. Here's why I have come to this understanding. So I think that, that's one of my favorite success stories because it's not solved yet, but we've been making great strides by following one of the basic principles of, of conservation social science, which is the building of strong relationships on which trust and respect can be overlaid. So Kathy, and if you could add, I don't know if you know this or not, but what is what are some of the main causes of mortality for the released condors um, out now? there? More, like how do released condors die now when they're in the field? Microplastics. Microplastics. Yeah. So there's other issues, and they st and they're still impacted by lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. So the issues that put the condor in uh, in peril never were fixed. Yeah. Uh, we figured out the biology. We figured out how to raise them. Um, we figured out how to release them but we released them into the same environment in which they were, um, they were dying. Mm -hmm. We were lucky in that figuring out how to breed them and release them was successful. There are a lot of animals for which that's not the case. And so while we key continue to work on breeding, a, a good article actually just came out, I think in something fancy, like National Geographic, um, about the condor issue. 
But while we're working on things like lead and microplastics, we can continue to do good, do the breeding work and do the reintroduction so we can have animals flying in the pinnacles and in the Grand Canyon. Here you go. <laughs> Her hand shot up. She was ready. Hi. She won that argument too. <laughs> My name is Val. It's really nice to meet you. In your conversation about are we preferring the animals over the people, mm -hmm. how are you going about explaining the fact that the microplastics and all of these other things are actually caused mm -hmm. by people? Mm -hmm. And that many people don't understand that, that we are actually forcing animals out of their habitat mm -hmm. by populating their areas. Yeah. Where are we going with that? Yes. Where, where are we going with that, Val? Um, so <laughs> I would say one of the, the first things that comes to mind is, I'm going to go back to empathy, right? So we, we are suffering from an empathy deficit all over our society. But in another project that I've been working on, we've been thinking about how to intentionally foster empathy for animals within zoos and aquariums, within our institutions. And that's, that's expanding, expanding broader now into like larger environmental education facilities. So if you think about the moment when the tide turned on straws, people have been working on straw stuff for a long time. The moment the tide turned, can you tell me what it was? It was a video that came out. Does anyone know? The turtle. Yep, exactly. And that was a visceral feeling in your gut that you had when you saw that turtle get its straw pulled out of your nose, out of its nose. And people, like, that's empathy right there in its rawest, purest form. And people said, oh my God, like, what are we doing? Like, what is happening to the planet that we're having turtles with straws up their noses? And so that kind of spurred these cities to take on legislation about banning straws. It, you know, in innovation came up where people were ramping up their, their efforts to create silicon straws and collapsible straws and breakable straws and all that kind of stuff. And so I would say we got to start with empathy. Start with trying to foster empathy for the animals so that people understand that those animals have a perspective and an experience on this planet that is valid and worthy of consideration. Like that's, the, that's the first thing because a lot of times that, that rejection of responsibility, that othering comes about because we don't want to we don't want to think about animals as, as knowable others or knowable entities. We want to think of them as unknowable others. So that makes it very, it's the same kind of tactics that are used to create racist ideologies, right? To think about they're not humans, they're something else. And so we've created that with animals that they're not, they're not humans, right? But they are something else. They are not as worthy. They don't have experiences like we have experiences. They don't have perspectives like we have ex perspectives. So dismantling that, we can start to get people to understand the range of ways in which animals experience the world. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, <laughs> what you're talking about is an educational program. Could, could be. Yeah. And going. this okay. aquarium is all about education. Mm -hmm. And Jerry's been very forthright with bringing social sciences into that. But it's, uh, it's one of his key points and very valid. The trick is when we bring the people into the aquarium and we engage them through the shows and the presentations to get them to go into that Socratic irony mode of asking why mm -hmm. or what because that's the basis of our of our civilization is, mm -hmm. is questioning. And uh, uh, that's been the tricky part is making that thing from entertainment or or making them happy with their experience at the zoo or the aquarium to getting them to question that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, the effort that we're all going through all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife through volunteering and me through just, you know, talking with people. Yeah. So that's a, it's a very valid juncture and one that has to be explored more. So Absolutely. I mean, I am not saying this is going to be easy. Um, in fact, it's, it's, you can choose how easy or hard you think it's going to be, right? Doing nothing is super easy. I'm saying that I am dissatisfied with the way that conservation has happened thus far. There's a lot of good and a lot of potential that I see, though, and that's what keeps me standing here. And maybe it, you know, maybe it comes from retraining people about how to think <laughs> about the sciences in general. 
How about think? Yeah, absolutely. Training them to think it up. Um, but I have optimism that we are the best places for that work to get done, right? Because we are accessible to many. We can be accessible to more. And we are interested and passionate about these subjects. And we have the urgency that a lot of other places don't have. And get the kids. Yes, and we can get the kids and their parents. Yeah. Back to your theme of complexity. Many years ago in Maryland, a lot of bottom feeding waterfowl were dying. Mm -hmm. And the hypothesis was they were dying of lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. a and uh, the results showed, though, they were not dying of lead poisoning. Maryland, though, passed a, a law that uh, lead shot was out, steel shot was re would replace it. And it turned out that uh, they were dying not from lead poisoning, but they had so many uh, pieces of shot mm. in their, their gut, they thought that they, were, they had eaten and they were full and they were starving to death. Mm. It was a very interesting study. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's right, similar issue with microplastics. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Um, so my question is about, you know, as zoos and aquariums, we're really good at engaging our guests and getting them really excited and hopefully creating some empathy with the animals mm -hmm. that we have in our care. Um, what role do we have to play or do you know of educational um, programs mm -hmm. that target um, creating empathy for the communities of people mm. that live in the areas where these conservation issues are happening. Yeah, I would point you towards the Detroit Zoo. Um, they have a pretty amazing program that was happening um, with their local prisons and juvenile detention facilities. And they were doing a lot of really amazing work with those, um, with those communities and trying to create empathy not only for animals but for people also. And that was through their Center for Humane Education. Mm. Really awesome example. Um, this is also the hot button issue, right? And something that we need to continue to think about. I think once we hear that that's possible, we want it all at once, right? Like, oh, well, we can create empathy for people. Let's just do that now. And then that, that will solve all of our problems. These are things that we'll slowly have to work on over time. Um, we're still trying to figure out how and in what ways and when it is appropriate to create empathy for animals and work towards that idea of creating empathy for the larger, for your community, for people who are different from you, et cetera. But I agree that it's a highly interesting and very important area for us to work, and I would encourage us to keep pushing ourselves in that direction and not being satisfied just when we say, like, great, that kid showed empathy for that animal. I can go home. Not that we would do that, but. Uh, this is in direct follow-up to that question. Great. So we were in the meeting earlier today where kind of preparing to talk to you, mm -hmm. we're um, discussing, Dave brought up the question about, you know, that when you go to a bunch of zoo people and say, what are you guys trying to get your guests to feel? And they go, well, empathy, and mm -hmm. aquarium people say engagement. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe unpack for us a little bit about, from your perspective, where empathy fits into engagement mm -hmm. and kind of what ingredients maybe are needed in addition to empathy yeah. to kind of really get the action that we need to take place? Does yeah. that make sense? Yes, there are so many directions I could go with an answer. Okay, let's talk about conservation biology for a second. Or, sorry, behavior. So conservation behavior, we have had, there has been this, been this fallacy in environmental education for a long time that knowledge leads to attitude leads to behavior, right? There's a very well-meaning but very dumb quote that something like, the more I know, the more I'll love, the more I'll love, the more I'll act which is so sweet, but so not how things work, right? There's so much more to behavior than what you know and how you feel. So if you want to challenge that, you can think about the most environmentally unfriendly thing that you do on a daily basis. And think about all of the systems that are in place that perpetrate that behavior and allow it to continue despite everything you know and despite everything you care about. So behavior is based on intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. For example, if you want someone to do something one time, like buy a Tesla or buy an Energy Star appliance, you're going to up the external motivators because you don't care how much they care about the environment. You just want them to do that thing one time in 20 years because that's all that's required. So you're going to make tax breaks. You're going to come in and install the electric plugins in their house. You're going to take away their old one for free, whatever. If you want the harder behaviors, the more than the one-time actions, the things that last over time despite inconvenience, despite going against social norms, you have to be rely pretty heavily on intrinsic, in, uh, intrinsic outcomes or intrinsic motivators. 
And so empathy is one of those intrinsic motivators. And it is one tool in a wide toolbox of things that you have at your disposal to influence behavior. For the straw thing, empathy was a great tool. That was something that we had the power to have to show people an image, to show people something and have them feel a visceral reaction, again, that then led to a specific behavior that they could see and, cr and create action on immediately. For some other things, like climate change, it's a lot harder. It's very difficult for people to see how driving their car less and taking the bus for two hours every day helps polar bears. The disconnect is much larger. And so when we're thinking about behaviors, yes, empathy is one piece. Values are also critically important. Social norms, very important. Legislation and infrastructure, also very, very important. If we can make the easy thing the more sustainable thing, eat, done. We're done. Like that is, that is one of the best things that we can do to drive environmental behavior. If we can get people to not even think about it and create and choose something environmental, then a lot of our work in empathy and in, you know, blah, blah, blah isn't, necess isn't as necessary. How do we get there? There's a lot of different opinions on that. Does that answer your question? No. The answer still remains, uh, remains out there. It, it's one of a suite of tools. Yeah. So empathy has a role. It is not the right tool in every single outcome. It is not the right tool in every single scenario. But for a lot of the issues in which the behavior is so closely tied to the animal welfare outcome or the animal outcome, it could be a pretty good solution. Otherwise, respect, awe, wonder, love, curiosity, those are all related constructs that could be building blocks to empathy or could stand alone and be interesting in and of themselves. Yeah. I think I'm just going to add one piece that Luke yeah. might be wanting to hear more about. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is to consider the differences, especially with your experience at both zoos and aquariums. Um, and I know you have lots of thoughts about this. So oh, great. would you maybe just sort of start that conversation about um, the differences between zoos and aquariums and the, oh, the roles the, that they play? The couple differences between, yeah. Um, so maybe what you're thinking about a little bit is, is charismatic animals versus non-charismatic animals. So at the zoo, and at, there are aquarium animals that are very charismatic, we are blessed with animals like elephants and giraffes and big cats, cheetahs, thing, lions, things like that, that are empathy machines in and of themselves. Like people go up to the chimp enclosure and almost to a fault, definitely to a fault, will anthropomorphize and um, will connect to the chimp in ways that are not always entirely factually accurate, um, but they can create an empathic connection very easily. At aquariums, we have things like sea cucumbers and barnacles and sea stars. Animals that people don't think of as actually even being animals, but instead of being like, I didn't know that a barnacle was not a rock, right? And so we're starting from a very different place. Um, and when we're doing, when we're trying to make those kinds of, those kinds of, uh, trying, to, trying to create empathy in those kinds of ways, we draw on four areas. We draw on the agency of the animal. So how, um, how is the animal able to groom, play, feed, drink, perform social behaviors, et cetera. How does the animal look like a whole animal? Can we highlight eyes? Can we highlight legs, feet? For some reason, our brains see an animal with eyes, legs, feet, arms, blah, 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 and we think that's an animal. Those things are absent, not an animal. So we need to bring those out for people. Um, continuity, how much time we spend with the animal is a big driver of empathy. If you can get people to spend more time watching or thinking about an animal, they're going to be more likely to be empathic towards it. We used to, one time on a trip, we broke down in the middle of the Baja Desert, and we had the students in a moment of desperation do what we called a cactivity, where we had them just sit and stare at a cactus for 20 minutes while we figured out what was wrong with our van. Um, and it was fascinating, because the empathy that people felt, at first they were like, this is ridiculous, but then the more they watched, the more they thought, the more they just immersed themselves in this space, the more they were like, wow, like, there's a tiny little insect that's just crawling, he's just crawling up. He's been crawling up for like 15 minutes, you know? And they start to have more, they start to see the perspective, the experience of the creatures in this ecosystem more than they ever would if they just kept on driving. And the last one is affectivity. So how much does the animal look like it expresses emotion? And our issue as humans is that if an animal, if animal doesn't have a face, we will replace vitality with affectivity. So if the animal is moving, it is happy. If the animal is sitting, it is sad. 
And so those are, those are four areas in which we tell interpreters to start to think about how can you massage those and work with them to try to bring out the traits of non-charismatic animals to be a bit more charismatic. I can give more examples, but I'll stop there. I see hands and, and microphones. I have a microphone. You have a microphone. Um, so when you talk about, <laughs> stop it. I'm not the, I'm not the, microphone, the TV presenter. <laughs> so the question is, when we look at creating empathy for communities where we're performing conservation work, particularly from the zoo model, yeah. do you think that the diversity of our staff, both in field and in our zoos and aquariums, has an effect, positive or negative? Well, yes, it does. <laughs> um, I think the diversity of our staff absolutely has an effect. People who don't see people who look like them working on these projects are going to have a much harder time getting on board with, with what we're trying to do. It's that same question of, of almost tribalism. Like, are you part of my group? Do you share an identity with me? Are you similar to me? And we automatically, just based on our reptilian brains, trust people more when we feel like they're part of our in-group. And so if we come in and we know nothing about the culture, we've never spent time there, we don't look like them, and we don't speak their lang language is a really interesting one. If you can just, if you can speak their language, like boundaries fall, right? It's really fascinating. We should be teaching more languages in schools. Um, then that, that can be a driver, that can elevate your conversation to the next level. That can get you to a place where you would have had to lay a lot of groundwork before you could get there originally. So absolutely, I mean, we are not diverse enough in our field. We just aren't. And we're trying to push that. And there are those of us who are loud and yelling about it and trying to get more people to come up with us and um, represent many different groups, not only colors of skin, but also met several other ways of being marginalized. And that's going to take work. It's also going to take some stepping aside, right? It's also going to take making room for those people because it is great to say that people of color and people from other communities who are not represented in our field should have space and then look around and say, but not my space, like not where I am, right? So how are we going to step aside and make room for all voices to be included instead of letting our voice constantly be the loudest? Yeah. So hi, question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going back to one of your slides, so the picketers outside the Oregon Zoo. Oh yeah. Um, that was a hard one to look at. Yeah. I like, deleted it from my computer <laughs> immediately after. I am quite sure that all zoos around the world are not created equal, and they're not as con conservationalist as others. Um, but there is this idea in our societies that it's captivity and not con Zoo is about captivity, possibly even torture, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to conservation. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what is, what's the, I guess, the broad reality of like, what are the state of the zoos around the world, if you can answer that? Oh, yeah. And also, just, how's that going to change the reality and also change the perception of people? Yeah. So you're right. All zoos are not created equal. There are, my favorite is when people come to me and they're like, I don't like zoos. I went to this one zoo in China one time. I'm like, OK, we're just going to, I have not been, I cannot speak to the quality of their holdings, you know. But I think people, the analogy I often give, and maybe it's a flawed analogy, but I'll give it here anyway on live broadcast, is that you know, if you were against faith healing or some other or anti-vaccination, would you then go shut down all the hospitals? Right? If some people isn't practicing medicine the way you want them to practice it, does that mean that you go and shut down the entire medical industry? Like if some zoos aren't doing what you want them to do and it doesn't look the way you want it to look, does that mean we shut down all zoos and aquariums around the world? No, it's crazy, right? Because they're, what's funny is that people will say, I don't like zoos and aquariums. And then my follow-up is always, oh, uh, well, my follow-up is, do you have a zoo in your community? And they say, oh, yes, I love my local zoo. It's the best. I love that zoo. Right? So people, wh where it starts is with your local zoo or aquarium. That's where we have to try to bring people in to be part of their communities. Maybe that doesn't actually mean being, bring, bringing people in, but means going out and being part of the community out in the world. And so when people can trust their local zoo, then we can start to get them to trust the aquarium when they go on vacation in Georgia, or the zoo when they go um, to visit family in Portland, right? So starting with your local community is a way of gaining trust, building respect, and creating community institutions, which is what we really should be. 
And I think that's a really one of the most exciting parts of supporting zoos and aquariums right now is we are at an inflection point. Zoos have gone through a wide history um, from the menageries of the past to the conservation organizations I know we can be in the future. And we are at another one of those pivot points. We are at another one of those L curves in the road or whatever. Um, and we have to decide how we want to tell our stories. We have to control how we want our messages to go out into the world. And we can do that. It's just going to take more creativity and innovation, again, um, that I know we're capable of. Yeah. Thank you so much for your suggestions as to how to connect and with other groups of people. That really helps me. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised by a mother who taught me to be an environmentalist before that word existed. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things like just reusing your lunch bag and that's natural. So I'm surprised that people have to be taught these mm -hmm. very simple things about recycling. Um, as a volunteer at a zoo and aquarium and an arboretum, I get to talk to young people and out of every group of about 20, there are about three that are engaged mm -hmm. <laughs> or seem to know anything about mm -hmm. the environment. And I was wondering if you have any experience or suggestions as to how we can raise the bar. And yeah. say like, it's okay to be smart. It's mm -hmm. okay to, you know, we don't have to dumb it down, do yeah. we? Well, so I would, I would challenge you and say that you don't have to know about the environment to love or care about the environment. Like, yes, knowing about it is great, there are, but I cared about the environment far before I knew anything about it. I didn't grow up in a particularly environmental family, which is ironic, my dad's an environmental scientist, but we didn't have, it wasn't part of our lives. You know, my parents love saran wrap and Ziploc bags, and my mom gets super excited when she goes to Costco and buys little guacamole that are in little plastic containers, and she does not understand why I don't want the guacamole in the plastic container. I did not grow up in a world where these values were instilled in me from an early age, right? But I still came to those values. So that there are people like that out there. I'm sure many of you have similar stories where you came to your environmental values later on in life. Reflect on those. What was it? Was it time spent outdoors? Was it knowing the names of all the trees? Was it touching a, you know, a seal lion for the first time? I don't know. Nobody really touches sea lions. But... <laughs> but the, so there's a field called significant life experiences. And that field dives into these ideas and thinks about what are the actual inflection points that lead people to take different paths in life. And so we fit very strongly into the significant life experiences literature because we can provide those life experiences. I would say to you, don't be discouraged if not every child immediately goes from your program to live a envi fully environmental life. But recognize that we are a building block in the lives of children. We may be the ignition point. We may be just one other time that they have heard those messages. And what's going to be important is that we repeat those messages in many different venues from many different points in many different places in their lives. If they hear it from celebrities and they see it on the television and they see it on their field trip to the zoo and they hear it in their classroom, that's going to be a lot more powerful than our voices just yelling into the void. Right, so you have power, you work in three different places, you volunteer in three different places, How, where are there more opportunities for us to cross message, for us to cross contaminate um, our educational programs so that we can spread the salmonella of environmental. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not always gonna be, it's not gonna be one experience in one place at one time. It is dependent on a broader tapestry of human experiences. Uh, thank you. Uh, to return back to the the picture of the protesters in front of the Oregon Zoo, it got me thinking right away that like that's that's not an example of not having empathy, and maybe no, it's, maybe it's not. the wrong kind of empathy, or it's too much empathy, or it's mis misguided empathy. What do you wh what practices can we pursue to make sure that we're not creating the kind of empathy that well that leads to that, and are instead creating an empathy that's more yeah. holistic or whatever yeah. you want to call it. So in our empathy work, we have found that there are six best practices that can be used to foster empathy. Um, and I would say that this is a representation of the knowledge piece. So you know, I just went on this whole tirade about how knowledge isn't everything. But knowledge is something, right? Back up for a second. We're never going to get everybody, right? We're never, ever, ever. 100% no, of people can't agree on literally anything, not even pizza in the world. And so we can't expect to hold ourselves to those standards and say that everyone's going to be our fan all the time. 
But what we can do is think about, as we've been talking a lot in this field, about the, move, the middle, right? The people who are skeptical, the people who maybe don't, don't know how to feel about us. And so, yes, empathy with lack of knowledge can lead to dangerous places. Um, Anthropomorph I'll bring it back to anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism in my world is not a dirty word. I actually anthropomorphize the heck out of things sometimes if it is the right tool in the right time in the right place. But like empathy, we fill in the gaps in our knowledge with our own experiences. So the more gaps that people have about the experiences of animals, the more they're going to fill in with their own experiences, and that's going to lead them to deep, dark, dangerous places. So they're going to, you know, we talk about our octopus at the aquarium when I was there, and it lives in a palatial octopus estate that, if you are not an octopus person, looks like a tiny jar. Um, but if, so people see it and they say, oh, you know, if I lived in a place that small, I would be really sad. And if I lived all by myself, I would be really lonely. Not knowing that octopi like small, octopods, like small spaces and they like to be alone and they would kill another octopus that came into their area. And so they fill in the gaps in their knowledge with their own experience, and that leads them to believe the animal is sad and lonely. And so we can build up their knowledge in these critical areas by helping them to understand what animals actually need and what their perspectives actually are in the world. So we say that when you have an animal that is very similar to you, highlight the differences in your experience and that animal's experience. If you have an animal that is very different from you, highlight the similarities. And that brings people into a middle understanding where they're not seeing chimpanzees and elephants and gorillas as being exactly the same as humans, but they're not seeing barnacles and sea anemones and snakes as being alien other creatures. Move people to the middle. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, so you talked at the very beginning about how our world is kind of falling apart yeah. um, <laughs> and it's very depressing and overwhelming yeah. um, and part of that is conservation yes um, but part of that is is so many 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 issues um, you know the education system uh, poverty uh, mm -hmm. technology and the fear of where that's taking us all these different things and I've found over the years really being keyed into and being fascinated by uh, efforts that combine more than one of those concerns mm. in a solution. Yeah. Um, so, for example, prepared. yeah. So, for example, like, oh, you have a, a poor community that live on islands and there's tons of coral reef, but they're destroying it because they're fishing. And then you switch the mentality and say, if you actually didn't destroy the coral reef and invested in tourism, you get money and the coral reef gets saved. Those kind of combination things. Um, in some way, can you kind of open that up a little in terms yeah. of how how much effort is there being pushed into really thinking deeper into how can we combine issues, how can we combine solutions? Yeah. So what you're talking about is true interdisciplinarity, um, which I will not stand here and tell you that I am an expert on inter interdisciplinary sciences, but I have benefited from the tutelage of a lot of really incredible scholars on interdisciplinary approaches to conservation. So I'll say what I think they would say. Um, interdisciplinarity is, we're trying to make it happen, right? And, and it's going to be hard. True interdisciplinarity is going to be challenging as long as we have funding structures that only fund single single subject research projects. Now that's not every funder, right? There are funders out there who are interested. They're only going to talk to you if you bring a large group of scholars to the table. Those are cool. We should go for more of those funding things. Um, and I think, again, build relationships, right? Like sometimes, so the most complex problems are going to require the most creative solutions. And that's invigorating. That is so exciting because it means that when you are reading something about economics over here and you're reading something about conservation over here, the most exciting thing is going to be the nexus between those two. So looking for points in which we can overlay subjects on top of each other, bring in other people into our conversations. Like let's have economists come speak in zoos and aquariums and talk to us about the economics of tourism, right? Or let's have more psychologists from zoos and aquariums, more social scientists going into university classrooms and talking about the work that they do. We've lived for so long in silos. I am 100% not the first person to say that. I'm like the billionth. But we still live in them. We continue to live in them because they're comfortable. They make us feel like we are with the people who understand us. 
And going outside of our silos means maybe explaining things to people who would challenge us. But we need to do that. We need to do that more, and we need to do it more vigorously. And then I think we can achieve some of the interdisciplinarity you're dreaming of, because that's what's going to get us to those creative solutions that we need. Um, I was wondering about global warming and what oh, yeah, effect is that having on the zoos? Uh -huh. And if, depending on where the zoo is, does that change the type of species that's at the zoos? What a, yeah, such an interesting question. Um, yes, I, it should, right? And we, so I was just in a collections planning meeting, and we're thinking about that. Like, should we be bringing animals here that will not be comfortable in our facility given what we, you know, the uh, environments that we can recreate in our exhibits. And I think that's a question that we're asking more and more in when we think about animal welfare is what are the different dimensions of animal welfare and how can we think about all of them in a changing world? So comfort and habitat is a huge consideration, particularly when it is beyond us to replicate or too expensive or too carbon heavy to replicate the exhibits or the habitats that those animals live in in the wild. So yes, I, um, it is a great consideration and one that we should and are taking seriously throughout our facilities. So Kathy, and I thought maybe this would be a good wrap up question for you. Okay. Um, you are in a new position at the Oregon Zoo. You are the uh, conservation impact director. You get to uh, direct, design the future of conservation at the Oregon Zoo. Uh, you also mentioned we're at an inflection point mm -hmm. in conservation in zoos and aquariums. So looking into the future, into your magic crystal ball mm -hmm. of the job you're going to have and the, and the impact that you're going to create, what does conservation look like to you for zoos or aquariums or, or both? So the thing that was made me most excited about my job, the three, one of the reasons I decided to take it, was because I saw real, uh, real potential for integration. So previously, we have these conservation departments, and there's a director of conservation, and then some conservation research and conservation work, and we do some re-releases and breeding and all that stuff. But what I envision, what I hope we can create, is an integrated form of conservation that exists not only across all of the, um, all of the departments in the zoo, but beyond the zoo into their stakeholders in the community as well. So what we're trying to create in Oregon is an integrated conservation action plan that brings in diverse stakeholders from across the community, across the world, to think about how we can co-create outcomes for success for each of our conservation projects. So it's not one person or two people thinking about what success looks like, but we're bringing people from First Nations groups, um, from school groups, from you know, education and economics, and everywhere we can, ideally, to co-create what we think conservation should look like for our facility. And then we are the conveners of that conservation work. It is not our job to do conservation, but it is our job to facilitate conservation throughout our community and throughout our facility. So that's what I envision and what I hope for. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of work, right? <laughs> it takes convincing people that integration includes everybody, from horticulture to um, vet staff to you know, ad administration and finance and development in all those places, and that to our community, the zoo is the place where this work can happen. And we've laid a lot of the groundwork for that. The Oregon Zoo has a fantastic relationship with its community, um, and I hope to build on that work as we go on. Fantastic. And we'll bring you back in a year. You can tell us all of the okay, successes great. that you've had in that time frame. Perfect. All right, everybody, uh, thank you very much. So uh, that's going to be our talk for this evening. I want to remind you that our next lecture is on August 14th when uh, diver and photo photographer Mike uh, Bartik will be here to share photos and stories from his experiences exploring the ocean at night. Uh, if you can attend in person, please, please do. And uh, there's also, of course, the live broadcast. So thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight.